Hello once again, Matrika Lentz. It's really a great privilege to be able to speak with you once again. Today we're going to start with our last short story for the year, The New Tribe by Buche Inacheta. This is quite a long short story, therefore we will read it over two periods and then we're going to do the discussion in the third period. So relax, sit back, here we go. It was a dull morning, and Ginny was trying to rouse herself from sleep. Drifting up from downstairs was the aroma of coffee. Arthur had preceded her to the kitchen. Unusually for that time of the day, a frantic ring at the door pierced the quiet house. It sounded so urgent that Ginny leapt out of bed and looked out of the bedroom window. She could see Julian, the local paper boy standing there with his bundle of papers wedged in the handlebars of his bicycle. There was some sort of bundle in the large basket in front. Even from above, she could see Julian was trembling. She heard the sound of the front door opening and saw Julian take the bundle from his bicycle basket and thrust it at Arthur. She was about to turn away and look for a dressing gown when what she heard next stopped her in her tracks. It's a baby, stammered Julian. I was cycling past the phone booths in town and heard it crying. I looked inside and there was something in a Tesco bag. When I looked it was a baby. I didn't know what to do. So I brought it to you, Vicar. Jenny wasn't sure if the faint whimper which reached her was Arthur or the baby. Not waiting to hear more, she tied her blue dressing gown tightly around her and rushed downstairs. Arthur was still standing at the open door, the baby in his arms, a look of stupefaction on his face. A Tesco supermarket bag was at his feet. Jenny took the baby without a word, wrapping it inside her dressing gown, and backed away towards the kitchen. Julian mounted his bike and cycled off as if he had just delivered the morning paper. In the kitchen, Jenny gently unwrapped the baby, who was covered only in a blanket. In a hushed voice, she exclaimed, Arthur, it's a girl! Arthur stood bemusedly to one side as Jenny, the baby crept lovingly in her left arm, warmed the milk he had been going to drink with his coffee with a free hand. She looked as if she had been doing it all her life. When the milk was warm, she dipped her finger into it and carried it to the baby's mouth. She sucked it so eagerly that Jenny smiled. Holding the child in the crook of her arm as she sucked, it looked to Arthur almost as if she was breastfeeding. In spite of his shock, Arthur was moved. He had known Jenny wanted a child, but he had never seen her as a mother. She was so natural with the baby for the first time he understood what it meant to her. He ventured gently. We'll have to report this to the police. We need to find the child's mother and a doctor to see to the child. Jenny nodded and went on rocking the child and dropping the warm milk into her mouth. So the authorities were called. The doctor, the police and the social welfare office. The doctor pronounced the child perfect. It seemed she was only a few hours old. Since she needed care, and everyone could see how competent Jenny was, she was allowed to look after the baby. They agreed to call her Julia after Julian, the paper boy who found her. A national search failed to find any trace of the mother, who seemed to have vanished into thin air. The Arlingtons became the baby's official foster parents, but Jenny was impatient to get started on the procedures for adoption which she knew were lengthy and complicated. She happily submitted to the succession of in-depth interviews, the endless questionnaires and the personal probing of the social workers. Arthur passively went along with what he saw as his duty. Eventually, they were pronounced fit to be Juliet's adoptive parents. To mark the occasion, they immediately christened the child Julia. Jenny was overjoyed and talked of nothing else to her friends and parishioners. All her letters to Victoria and Robert were full of Julia's progress. 
at last she had been granted what she most desired. Another miracle had been performed. Julia brought a joy into their lives which Arthur especially had never imagined. They had lost touch with the social services and almost forgotten she wasn't their natural child. Julia was two and toddling in the kitchen when the phone call came. Arthur answered. He listened briefly and replaced the telephone. Social services want to see us on Wednesday at 11. Jenny was in shock. When she could speak, she whispered, What if they want to talk to us about Arthur? Arthur was as ignorant as she was. Jenny turned to the little girl who was playing happily with the plastic bottle top on the floor. Julia, you are going to stay with us, aren't you? She asked nodding as she always did. The child nodded back, mimicking Jenny. Stop worrying, Jenny. You'll drive yourself mad. Let's wait and see. They may want to talk to us about something else. You never know. But Arthur himself was disturbed. On Wednesday, the social workers came. They wanted to know whether Jenny and Arthur were ready to foster another child since they had turned out such exemplary parents. Everybody in the room could hear Arthur Arlington's exaggerated sigh of relief. My wife thought you were coming to take Julia away, Arthur explained. Take her away? Certainly not. She's your child now, reassured one of the social workers. But this little boy of 18 months could be a brother to Julia. Why us? Arthur couldn't help asking. As for Jenny, she was silent with shock. The officer brought out an envelope and gave it to Arthur. He glanced through it, gathering that they had been specifically chosen by the boy's mother because she had followed Julia's progress in the press. That she could not keep the toddler, Chester, because she had just found out she was expecting twins and the father was not ready to accept another man's child. As Jenny and Arthur were Christians, she was sure Chester would have a better chance in life with them than he would have with her. She loved her son very much, but could no longer keep him. Arthur passed the letter to Jenny. Tears welled in her eyes as she read it. I don't mind, she announced impulsively. I always wanted a house full of children. One of the social workers now spoke. Chester's mother is Nigerian. You need to be aware he is a black child. The room was frozen into silence. Jenny stared at the social workers questioningly. They nodded. Yes, Chester was black. Returning to the letter, she looked at the signature. Catherine Mba, she asked. Where is the baby now? He's in the care of the social services. He is very traumatized by being abandoned and we feel he needs a home as fast as possible. We wanted to know if you would consider giving him one while his case is assessed. Consider? What is there to consider? Jenny responded calmly, her protective instincts awakened. So once again, the Arlingtons found themselves unexpectedly parents. Chester cried a great deal at first and clung to Jenny, but was obviously well looked after. He was confident and trusting and gradually settled down. The fact that he was black only added to their feelings of having been specially chosen. How could a woman give up this beautiful child? Was a question they both asked themselves. At the same time, Arthur dreaded going through another bureaucratic probing if they were to adopt Chester officially. He had found it harder than his wife to endure the endless scrutiny of their health, their relationship, their financial standing and their emotional fitness. He was not sure he could go through it all again. He tried to warn Jenny of the risks in Chester's case. Jenny, apart from all the procedures, we can never be sure his mother won't pop up to claim her child at any moment, he cautioned. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it was Jenny's response. Arthur was struck, as often recently, by her calmness and certainty. She was stronger than he had imagined. However, 
Arthur made sure that every effort was made to persuade Catherine Mbad to come forward. It seemed she was determined not to be found. As the adoption proceedings dragged on, Jenny tried to remind herself they might not be allowed to keep Chester. She dreaded the possibility, as Chester and Julia were already inseparable. She decided to try and keep alive with Chester some memory of where he came from. As far as Jenny was concerned, Nigeria was one of those dreadful African countries where soldiers kept overthrowing the democratic government and chaos, poverty and violence reigned. She went to the public library and for the first time in her life began finding out a little more. She was surprised to learn that Nigeria was a country of many different languages and peoples, with a rich history and its own traditional way of doing things. As there were no children's books about Africa in the library, she decided to make one. Slowly and painstakingly, she made Chester a storybook based on an African folk tale she had read. She illustrated it herself, using details she had read about. On the cover, she painted green banana trees and tall, graceful palms surrounding a mud-walled compound. Inside the compound, she painted her own vision of an African village scene. Women carrying water pitchers on their heads, men sitting together under a shade tree, and children playing. She read the book to Chester every night until he came to know all the words and pictures by heart. Eventually, the Arlingtons were accepted by the social services as fit parents for Chester. Arthur sighed with relief the day the post brought the news. This is the last time, Jenny, he warned as he handed her the letter. I can't go through all that again. Jenny nodded. With her usual calm, she put it into the pocket of her house cardigan and danced around the kitchen holding the hands of the two youngsters. Arthur was yet again surprised by her hidden capacities, at the same time as being amused. Chester was christened Chester Arlington, brother to Julia Arlington. The children transformed Jenny. She was absorbed in looking after them and needed less of a husband. As the little marital game she had devised for the privacy of the bedroom became less frequent, Arthur found he actually missed them. Jenny had ignited his passion, only to leave him out in the cold. Now it was his turn to suppress his pain, while Jenny flourished. When Victoria wrote from Australia, she complained that Jenny had lost sight of everything except Chester, Julia and Arthur, as if they were the only people who mattered in the world. But they are in mine, Jenny said happily. Chester could not remember the exact moment when he knew he was adopted. It was like learning to feed yourself. You knew you must have been taught while you were in the cradle, but you could not pinpoint the exact minute or the particular hour. It began as a glimmer and gradually became a solid awareness, established, but somehow imprisoned inside him. However, even at the age of four or five, he felt a sense of unbelonging. He instinctively knew that broaching the subject with his parents would cause pain, and so he kept silent, but he was sure it would come to light one day. How and when, he had no idea. Meanwhile, the man he knew as his father was the Reverend Arthur Arlington, who was married to his mum, Jenny. The Arlingtons were like a good strong tree, under whose branches Chester and Julia sheltered. Jenny, in particular, showed great patience with the children, and Chester could not remember her raising her voice to him. So he was unprepared for his first real encounter with the outside world when he was sent to school. Julia had been at the same school since the year before and had told Chester so many stories about it that, in his imagination, it had become an extension of Sunday school. The day he started, he was in new shorts and shirt and a striped tie with matching cap. At first, he faced the new experience with enthusiasm, but at lunchtime he was tired and suddenly wanted to go home. He wanted mummy. He wanted to sit in a lap and have a read to him. He gave vent to a howl so loud and sudden 
that Miss Slattery, the teacher, jumped and ran to him. I want to go home, was all he could wail. Miss Slattery sat on a low chair, took Chester on her lap and consoled him. Yes, Chester, you will go home soon. We'll all go home at the end of the school day. The other new children, seeing the attention Chester was receiving, gave into their hitherto suppressed feelings of boredom and homesickness. The class joined in Chester's wailing. In desperation, the teacher dashed to Julia's class to borrow her from her teacher. When Chester saw Julia, he instantly stopped crying and held on to her. The teacher sighed with relief and congratulated herself for her ingenuity. Chester and Julia were allowed to sit side by side while they experimented with crayons. Despite the loss of their chief whaler, the other children continued to cry. Drawn by the noise, the headmaster came to investigate. As Miss Slattery explained the problem, he said jokingly to Chester, You little devil, you started the uproar and now look at you, laughing away with your sister. The teacher smiled, but Julia's face clouded. She piped up, Chester's not the devil, he's my brother. The headmaster and Miss Slattery gave each other a knowing look. Chester felt the change in mood immediately. And so did the whimpering pupils. He looked up from his painting and was confused. Julia, however, looked the headmaster straight in the eye and took her brother's hand. Chester was different and Mummy had told her to look after him. No one was going to pick on him. Chester only knew his sister was sad and cross. He didn't know why, but he felt responsible. After that, the sense of spoiling things for others remained with him for a long, long time and would not go away. Instinctively, Chester understood he had to behave and try not to cause trouble. A day or two after this incident, Ray Miller started school. He had been sick and hadn't come on the first day with the other children. As a result, they all knew each other and he felt left out. Ray tried to be brave because he knew boys didn't cry, but he felt lost all the same. His mother, Mrs. Miller, was the school dinner lady, and he watched sadly as the teachers congratulated her on how her little boy was settling down at school. Towards the end of the week, as his mummy left him at the classroom, he could no longer contain himself and set up a well for her to return. Chester, Wanting to show that he was a big boy, hitched up his shorts, marched up to his distressed comrade and put his arms round him. I cried too, he confided. But I don't cry anymore. Do you want to colour with me? They became comrades in arms. At lunchtime, Ray's mummy made sure the friends had extra helpings of whatever they wanted. As the first term drew to a close, the children were preparing a Christmas nativity play. Chester was chosen as leader of the three wise kings. Other children wanted the pot, but the teacher pointed out that the kings came from the Orient and would have looked like Chester. He didn't understand, but he was proud of the attention and prouder still of the satisfaction his mother took in making his costume. It was a long purple robe like the one in the Bible illustration and Chester had to try it on over and over again. You're a real African king, exclaimed Jenny. Now try on your crown. She had made the crown of cardboard and covered it in gold paper. It was a little big, but Chester was happy to wear it. What do you think, Arthur? Oh yes, Chester, you look grand. Chester looked at his parents, admiring him, and felt excited. On the day of the play, he enjoyed himself enormously in his purple velvet robe and shiny crown. After the play, there were hot mince pies and different kinds of juice. Many of the parents congratulated him on being such a good king. As they left the school hall, Chester ran up to say goodbye to Ray, who was dressed as a shepherd, with a crook in his hand. His father laughed and said jovially, 
Chester King of the Orient. On his way home in the dark with his parents, Chester slipped his hand into Jenny's and asked, What's the Orient, Mummy? It means the East, where the wise men come from, she responded. What's the East? he pursued. Jenny was silent for a moment, then she said, Africa's in the East. Where your people come from? In bed that night, he thought about her words, your people. He thought the Arlingtons were his people. The sense of unbelonging strengthened. Right, matriculants to be continued. We will continue the reading next time. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.